Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wi-Fi Now TV in association with RCR Wireless News. My name is Klaus Hetting, and I'm your host. On today's show, we've got Vivek Ganti of Cable Labs. He's going to talk about FILS, which is a new IEEE standard that promises to improve Wi-Fi quality and perhaps give some mobility to Wi-Fi. We're going to talk to him in just a moment. Also on the show, Joe Madden of Mobile Expert. He says that the carrier Wi-Fi market is upside down. We're going to ask him what he means by that. Join us right after this. Nexius, accelerating network and business transformation. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. My name is Klaus Hedding. I'm the host of the show. And on this week's show, we've got a couple of great guests. Vivek Ganti, as I mentioned, of Cable Labs, is going to talk about 802.11ai and what that can do for the user experience in Wi-Fi. And also at the end of the show today, we're going to talk to Joe Madden, uh, Joe Madden of Mobile Experts. He's just written a great report on carrier, carrier Wi-Fi. We're going to pick his brains about that. And he's a super, super analyst. So look forward to that. Also, just before we start, I want to plug my own show, my own conference, which is Wi-Fi Now, of course, the conference, and it's happening in Amsterdam this November 17th to 19th. Uh, Wilson, can you put up the graphic, please? I hope it's up there. And uh, in Amsterdam, we're going to have all the movers of sh and shakers of the Wi-Fi industry there. Uh, a lot of big European carriers, KPN, Zigo, Telenet. We're also going to have iPass and Boingo there. Some great speakers, great content, a lot of innovation. So if you're really serious about Wi-Fi, go to our website, wifinowevents.com slash gear. Check out our program and make sure you register. Come over to the great city of Amsterdam this November. Also, I just want to point out to all your, you uh, uh, faithful viewers out there that I've also got a LinkedIn group, a super, super active LinkedIn group of about 4,000 people. It's called Wi-Fi Now Forum, and you can find it by searching on that on LinkedIn. And I very much recommend that you get involved in that. We've, we've got lots of news analysis, debates, lots of people pitching in with great commentary. So go to that group. And uh, if you're on LinkedIn, of course, most of you will be. Go to that group and uh, apply to be a member. I'll approve that immediately. And you can also connect to me while you're doing that. Anyway, and I'll, I'll be delighted to uh, be one of your connections on LinkedIn. So uh, that's it for my personal plugs uh, this time around. I just want to mention uh, one thing that I picked up on in the news stream regarding Wi-Fi this week, a uh, really interesting news item. So uh, it has been reported that Wi-Fi network aggregators, uh, service providers, if you will, DeviceScape and iPass have teamed up. They say they've now got a network of 40 million hotspots between the two of them. So this is a new partnership between iPass and DeviceScape. And iPass says they're going to add another 10 million hotspots through a yet undisclosed new partnership. That uh, will take this new combined Wi-Fi network to 50 million hotspots. That is, as far as I know, the biggest Wi-Fi network in the world. Um, maybe outside of China Mobile or something like that. But that's a huge Wi-Fi network. And uh, we'll be following this very carefully and closely to see what these two companies are going to be doing with this uh, huge network. Also, I want to say in the coming weeks, I'm going to have, uh, I'm chasing him right now, iPass CEO Gary Griffiths. I, I'm pretty sure he's going to come on the show and to talk about all of that and maybe tell us a little bit about what uh, his plans are for putting that massive network to use. So you can look forward to that and watch this space. All right, that's it for the news items. And on to our first guest, Vivek Ganti of Cable Labs. Vivek, you're a network a wireless network architect, is that correct, for Cable Labs? That is correct. Okay, and you've been doing uh, some work on a new standard, which is generally not well known. I, I've, you know, outside of you and I, I've actually not heard anybody mention it yet, which is surprising because I think it has a lot to offer. The standard is called 802.11ai or FILS, 
Can you tell us a bit uh, about at a high level how, how, what the standard is going to do for us? Sure. Um, I agree with you. I think there needs to be more press on AI, and it's unfortunate that you and I seem to be the biggest soldiers for that. <laughs> uh, but AI is really the amendment. Uh, it's an 802.11 uh, 802 amendment, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's being called FILS, which is fast initial link setup, like you just mentioned. And uh, really the objective of this uh, amendment is to enable a client to establish a link with an access point much faster than it does today. And, um, not just faster, but also make it more robust. So uh, this entire process of link setup, which is really your um, client discovering the access point, um, scanning, the network discovery, authentication, association, and also provisioning, um, takes up a lot of time today. It takes up almost five to 10 seconds, uh, worst case scenario. And that's a problem. And that's what AI is trying to solve. Okay, and you also uh, wrote in a recent blog that uh, right now we're seeing, as you said, we're seeing many seconds. It takes many seconds for a Wi-Fi call essentially to be set up or uh, uh, to be connected, a Wi-Fi device to be connected with a data link to uh, an access point. You're actually working on getting this down to what, 100 milliseconds, which begs the question, are we getting into some form of mobility if these setups happen that fast? Can we expect uh, some kind of mobility here? Absolutely. So yes, it can take from five to 10 seconds, like I mentioned. And what AI is aiming for, the targeting for is something less than 100 milliseconds. That's the target. I think more realistically, it's going to be um, about half a second or so um, from what I understand. Um, but yeah, it will definitely help in mobility situations also because as of today, to transition between access points in an ESS, the only fast transition mechanism that is available for one to use is 11R. Uh, FILS is particularly useful in situations where the target AP cannot establish new keys with the Wi-Fi client without any exchange. And um, I think examples of such, such situations would be service provider Wi-Fi networks with uh, autonomous APs and no controllers, um, or even with multiple wireless LAN controllers. So mm -hmm. yes, it's definitely going to help with mobility um, and also robustness where a large number of users are trying to uh, yeah. connect to the access point at the same time. Right, exactly. So you've also, before we talked, we talked about this or you wrote about this, you gave two examples. One is when somebody is essentially on the move, even just walking down the street and actually uh, would like to connect to, to successive access points, if you like. And the other example would be uh, in what, in a high density situation? Absolutely. Um, so one of the major use cases for AI being discussed is called the Tokyo Central Station use case, yes. where imagine a large number of users constantly entering and exiting within a short span of time. So what happens in this scenario is in just a few seconds, there's a sudden large influx of people entering the coverage area of an ESS. And all these cell phones, all these tablets, all these um, laptops, you know, who are just in a train suddenly want to associate with the APs in the station. Um, and this can lead to a probe storm where there's probe requests, unicast probe responses, et cetera. And this can really bring down the network for a few seconds, which is essentially the problem that AI is trying to solve. So um, basically AI is trying to make this process of link setup much more scalable, robust, and faster than it is now all this doing uh, while maintaining the security mechanisms. Right, exactly. And, and the other use case I think you mentioned uh, uh, before is, is the use case where somebody is actually moving, an individual person moving between APs. I mean, I just mentioned the, you know, the 50 million hotspot uh, story coming out of iPass and DeviceCape. I mean, uh, and of course, you know, I don't know what the, there are obviously all sorts of network implications, but you can imagine that for a footprint like that, when you move between uh, access points, uh, the AI standard would help a lot to maintain, you know, the video call or the voice call or the data call, whatever you have going there. Is that true? Yes. Um, and that, that again goes back to the faster scenario that I was talking about where uh, to get into a little more detail in terms of security, instead of having four round trips between the client and the AAA server, you're just going to have two round trips. 
uh, with AI. So that really helps in mobility, in, in the mobility case where a client is trying to reassociate with an access point in, um, um, in the same ESS. Um, also, there's this, uh, the way it's making it quicker is it's concurrently sending the provisioning messages, the DHCP messages along with the association messages. It's piggybacking this. So mm -hmm. that way it actually makes the process quicker. Um, there's also other mechanisms being proposed, um, like instead of sending a unicast probe response from the access point to the client, when a large number of clients are trying to associate to the access point, um, the APs might just send one broadcast or a multicast response. Mm -hmm. That really areas that's Yeah, right, okay. Can, can you give us a status on, on the standardization work? Is it still in progress? And when do you think uh, it might be finalized? Um, it is still in progress. Uh, from what I understand, the task group is definitely at work. And um, from what I understand, it, it will be uh, added to the specification, the 802.11 specification, sometime in March to mid-2016, so sometime next year. And, uh, you know, the chipset manufacturers will be working depending on that timeline. Right, exactly. So we're talking about possibly sometime late we're talking about possibly sometime late next year that we could see this uh, standard implemented or what do you think? Well, if you look at Qualcomm's public website, they do claim that this is an area of research for them. Uh, they actually say that they see a 15 times betterment in the link setup time, which is great. Um, and um, so I, it, it, I think it could also be possibly earlier than that, um, but that's just me estimating it. Okay. But, concepts I just described should be technically feasible with software upgrades. So because we're only changing the Mac layer or Wi-Fi, we're not really changing anything in Fi. So um, it should definitely might be uh, able, I mean, we should be able to do it with software upgrades and should be faster than. Right, exactly. So I was going to ask you about that. So in order to get this working everywhere, so to speak, or in as many places as possible, obviously the access points need to be upgraded somehow uh, and with software upgrades and so on. I mean, do you see this, do you foresee this being a part of home Raptors as well, or is it purely a carrier play or is because that software upgrade needs to be managed somehow, presumably? Yeah. Um, the benefits in my opinion are primarily in a carrier Wi-Fi scenario. Uh, and if, like I mentioned before, if we do want to see uh, it, if you do want to see the benefits, then there has to be an upgrade on both the client and the access point. Um, and you know, there's working groups within the WFA who have um, who, who are working on features who, whose objectives align with that of AI. So I wouldn't be surprised if it is standardized as a part of a certification program in the future. But um, that would depend on how the vendors want to upgrade their devices mm -hmm. and how they want to deploy it going forward. Great stuff, Vivek. Thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us that briefing on AI. And it's something that I really think, the more that I think about it, the more I think that it, it's got to have huge benefits for uh, for carrier Wi-Fi especially. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, and keeping in touch with you and hearing more about your work in that area. But just last question. Are you testing it live in Cable Labs? Are you allowed to tell me? or I'm not allowed to tell you. Okay. All right, I won't push you on that. Fair <laughs> enough. Vivek, thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, it's really a delight to have you. Okay. Thank you. Thank All you, Tess. All right, everybody. Our next guest uh, on the show is uh, Joe Madden of Mobile Experts, and Joe is a great analyst. He's been around for a number of years, uh, writing reports, being quoted in the media and everything. And Joe is, has recently released a report on the state of carrier Wi-Fi. And we're going to pick his brains about that in just a second because he's, had, uh, he's, uh, he's pointed out some remarkable features of the carrier Wi-Fi market. Joe, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. Thank you very much, Klaus. Great to be here. All right, good. Uh, Joe, can you tell us a little bit about this statement that I alluded to in the beginning? You said that the carrier Wi-Fi market is upside down, and I find that super interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, of course. Uh, well, you know, as an analyst, I've, I've been watching the mobile market now for, for more than 20 years. 
Uh, and one thing that you notice about uh, the communications business is that operators tend to take the amount of money that they make on revenue and allocate a portion of that to their capital spending. Uh, so uh, the way I like to say it, you know, the, uh, uh, the service provider uh, will, will pay a few bucks to the equipment operators uh, so that they can make big bucks on the service revenues. And right. uh, service revenues are always more than the capital spending in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not the case in carrier Wi-Fi. Uh, when we look at the, the carrier Wi-Fi market, and we define that broadly as meaning carriers that are putting Wi-Fi equipment out there for, for public use, as well as public venues and sporting arenas and airports and convention centers uh, that are public buildings. Uh, so uh, in terms of carrier and public Wi-Fi, we see spending on equipment in the range of $800, $900 million per year. Uh, but uh, the service revenues are only in the range of Two or three hundred million dollars right. per year. Uh, right. So well, the market is upside down. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, Wilson, can we bring up the graphic that that shows that? Perhaps that's the carrier Wi-Fi market graphic, which shows the two bars of the uh, the service revenue, which is small compared to what three times as much in terms of equipment spend. So, yeah, absolutely, that is completely upside down. So, so why are you know the carriers? spending money on this. I mean, I know that you've commented on the retention case. When you talk to them, and I've talked to them many times, they all say that it's a retention case. You know, they, they don't make money directly on this, but they do it through retaining customers and keeping customers happy and, and so on and so forth. But you've also said, Joe, that you don't quite believe in that. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's true. Well, uh, you know, talking about the United States, uh, the cable companies here in the U.S. are uh, more or less a monopoly. Each each cable company has its own designated territory, and uh, they don't have competition within that territory. So I don't really believe that customer retention is the primary motivation here. Uh, they are deploying carrier Wi-Fi equipment. Uh, that is a great service for their customers, and I think it is it is intended to help customer satisfaction. Uh, so the, there is no doubt that they're they're doing that, uh, but I think at the same time the the cable companies are experimenting with ideas around wireless services that mimic a mobile service. Uh, if you were to look at the, the service from Cablevision, uh, the Freewheel service, uh, they're now offering something that that behaves like a mobile phone service where you can do calling and texting over Wi-Fi, and uh, and it's ten dollars per month instead of the eighty dollars per month you might pay to a a major LTE carrier. Right, exactly. And, and do we know anything about the Cablevision service? Because I've actually been trying to get a hold of the Cablevision guys. And if you're out there, Cablevision, come on the show and tell us. I'm not sure that they will, but anyway, that's an appeal. But we know, do we know anything about that service? Joe, do you have any insights about it? Because I also think they're watching. I mean, the other guys are watching. Well, I hope so. And, and uh, you know, frankly, I think it's an experiment. We, we have a large cable network here in the United States, and that's uh, it's a very convenient network when it comes to backhaul and, and distributing these radio signals. Uh, Wi-Fi is an, an inexpensive thing for them to deploy, and this is a service that they can offer. So uh, I think it's early days to really say how it's going with Cablevision, and I, I would say that really the rest of the industry is in a wait-and-see mode uh, to, to learn how many subscribers can they really gather on that network, what pricing can they really achieve, and uh, it's an experiment to see whether there's a direct ROI for the cable operators in investing in carrier Wi-Fi. If so, right. then see those carrier uh, service revenues shooting upward. Yeah, absolutely. And last week we also saw, I'm sure you noticed, the uh, announcement that T-Mobile and Bright House uh, has teamed up for T-Mobile customers to be able to roam onto Bright House Wi-Fi hotspots in the Florida area. And I think that is also at this time, a trial, uh, but is that something, I mean, that to me is significant. How do you view that, Joe? Oh, absolutely. I think these are the two competing business models. Uh, one is direct uh, wireless services to customers and uh, Cablevision's trying that. Bright House is trying the opposite approach, which is to partner up with a mobile carrier and collect roaming revenues. Uh, personally, I believe that the second case will be more successful and more widely used uh, around the world. Uh, and, and there are certainly LTE carriers that don't have good coverage everywhere uh, that need some way to do that. Uh, so between Sprint and T-Mobile, there may be uh, more significant revenues in roaming uh, than the cable operators can get in direct sales of Wi-Fi services. 
Right, absolutely. That's a super interesting point. And we're going to be following that very closely uh, in the coming weeks and months. The, the other thing that I'd like to ask you about is Hotspot 2.0, because specifically the T-Mobile and Brighthouse uh, trial actually right now is uh, supposed to be working on Hotspot 2.0 technology, which is standardized and so forth. And you do mention in your blog that you do see some um, some growth opportunity there. How do you view Hotspot 2.0? Because it's not really been moving very quickly outside of a couple of the MSOs and Boingo, of course, uh, in the US. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Hotspot 2.0 has been available for a while, but I, I see it as a fundamental building block toward building these, these new business models. Uh, they, if the cable operators want to make money in, in roaming for a mobile service, uh, Hotspot 2.0 really has to be there in order to facilitate that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's actually quicker to uh, create a new technology than it is to create a new business model. And uh, we've seen Hotspot 2.0 uh, tested between carriers very successfully. Uh, I think the testing phase and the trials are uh, considered successful around the world at this point in time. Uh, so now it's, it's about commercial development and, uh, and experimenting and negotiating what are the right terms for a Hotspot 2.0 roaming agreement. Right, exactly. So how do you view somebody like, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, somebody like iPass and DeviceScape teaming up now? By the way, those, those two companies are two completely different ways of aggregating Wi-Fi networks. Uh, and DeviceScape uses a, what they call a curated amenity uh, approach, which is, uh, or amenity Wi-Fi hotspot approach, which is actually also crowdsourced, while well, iPass has a more sort of managed um, Wi-Fi hotspot, more traditional approach. And that, as far as I know, there's no hotspot 2.0 involved in that. But I also understand now that it, they will provide, or at least iPass has come out and said they will provide a, you know, a seamless, uh, transparent functionality that that will do something similar. Are we sort of on two divergent? Uh, uh, paths here, one with Hotspot 2.0 and the other one with anything that works? That's possible, but you know, the anything that works model has been uh, tried many times for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen many different variations on this. And uh, I, I haven't seen real revenue resulting from that. Uh, if you were to look at the revenue from iPaaS and Boingo in the actual Wi-Fi services directly to customers, uh, it's just not big enough to justify the investment in, in Wi-Fi. Okay, uh, I wanted to ask you, the $270 million that you came up with, I think that's the figure in the graph, right? Right. Um, th that's why carrier Wi-Fi service revenue from anybody out there that presumably has a carrier Wi-Fi network, including Boingo, iPass, and whomever else, and, and the MSOs, or how did, you, how did you come up with that number? Yeah, that's right. That's including the MSOs and, and others. Uh, but most of the larger operators don't charge for Wi-Fi as right. a supply item. Right. Uh, and, and there is a perception now in the public that Wi-Fi is free. So, uh, so adding that on as, as an additional cost uh, may be unpopular with the end users. Uh, you know, my point of view is that LTE and, and Wi-Fi in combining together with each other uh, is really a much better way to monetize Wi-Fi uh, than we've seen in the past. Uh, some of these uh, device scape iPad sorts of combinations, those are helpful in aggregating a lot of Wi-Fi access points together, uh, but there's still a disjointed network of a lot of different vendors, uh, different APs, different software. Uh, yes. You will get a variable quality of service throughout that network, uh, which is very difficult for those companies to control. Uh, I think when you start tying into LTE control channels as an anchor, uh, whether you're using Wi-Fi on the unlicensed band or using LTE on the unlicensed band, that LTE control channel as an anchor will improve the quality of service and, and the ability of the operator to control what the uh, end user is getting. Okay, very good. We're going to come back to the LTE discussion in just a second. I did want to bring up the second uh, graphic. Can you pull that up, Wilson? Uh, I think it's supposed to be called offload savings because I, I understood from also from your blogs, Joe, that you're actually a believer in the offload story. And I think, I don't know if it's politically correct or even right, you know, technically right to call it offload these days. I think it's the wrong word personally, but the convergence story, I like to call it convergence. So you're actually, you're actually a big believer in that, right? Uh, yeah, offload is not a popular word these days no. uh, because it has, uh, it implies that you're, 
dumping off this user into a best effort sort of situation with, mm -hmm. with a lower quality of service. Uh, uh, so from that point of view, maybe I'm not a believer in offload. What I, what I think will happen is that the LTE operators will maintain control of that customer. Uh, the customer will still be connected over an LTE control channel and uh, there will be some management over the quality of service. If the, if the Wi-Fi signal becomes weak for whatever reason, uh, they can flip back to LTE to continue that data session. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's not being offloaded so much as managed. And uh, by doing that, a mobile operator can avoid a lot of uh, expense in, in building up a huge amount of capacity in their LTE network. Right, exactly. Because also in your report, you have, uh, you have enormous savings for operators if they use that model, right? And that, that's, that's what you're predicting or proposing. Uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, there's huge spending in, in the mobile industry on the equipment. And uh, when you look at what's going on, you know, a few years ago, uh, there was the, the, the data over a mobile handset was roughly 50% over Wi-Fi, 50% over uh, 3G or 4G. Uh, now that number has moved into the 75% range for Wi-Fi. Uh, and our prediction is that, you know, in the, in the near future, we'll see 90% of data through smartphones moving over the unlicensed band. Uh, the question is, how is that data going to be managed? Uh, I think uh, the, the monetization happens through the license bands and through people that will pay for a higher quality of service and availability everywhere. Uh, so we need to take advantage of that billing model, uh, but offload uh, some of the, the heavy lifting of the data uh, while maintaining control and quality through those LTE control channels. And I think this is a this is the convergence of the industry, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need to see is, is a cooperation between people that are building out Wi-Fi networks and people that have the ability to collect money from the customer. Right, exactly. And, and is it still, is it still, well, you mentioned that offload is, is an unpopular <laughs> word and I've been working in that space for ages and nobody, even the, even the companies that are actually offloading won't tell you that they're offloading because it's uh, so politically uh, difficult for them to get into that apparently. So uh, do you, do you see resistance against it still? Or are we starting, uh, are we gradually starting to move towards uh, more acceptance of mobile and Wi-Fi coming together? I'm talking about from the carriers point of view, the mobile carriers specifically. Well, I, I mentioned that we're in this period of experimentation and business models and uh, people are waiting to see whether cable vision can make it and in selling a service competing with the mobile operators. Uh, I think that's an important experiment. Uh, if Comcast and Time Warner and the other cable companies decide to compete with the mobile carriers, uh, then we're, we're gonna remain in an, uh, an era of competition between the two air interface standards. Uh, mm -hmm. But if that experiment is not that successful, then we'll see a lot more of these roaming agreements and cooperation between Wi-Fi and LTE players and uh, and I think that would actually be better for everyone right and also I think it was earlier this year I, I read some very strong critical comments of uh, the spending I think it was close to 50 billion dollars on new uh, license spectrum in the US from the mobile operator side and you were voicing some uh, quite some criticism of that in and do you think they should be spending their money elsewhere basically <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the great thing about being an independent analyst is I can say what I really think. Uh, when, when I see the carrier spending $40 billion on a, a little chunk of spectrum, uh, in, what I realize is that they could spend a lot less than that in the spectrum they have and deploy a lot more capacity than they would get out of that, that additional chunk of spectrum. Uh, so uh, we, we aren't really uh, in a phase where you know spectrum is is that much necessary. We do have tools to deal with uh, increasing the capacity and the density of our networks uh, under spectrum constraints. We have small cells, we have Wi-Fi uh, and combinations of aggregation with Wi-Fi and DAS systems and other ways to do this. Uh, so I don't think it's absolutely necessary to have more spectrum to do more capacity. Uh, there is there is a decision to be made by each operator. Should I spend $40 billion for a little more spectrum or could I spend $10 billion to build out some small cells and do some Wi-Fi aggregation? Yeah, absolutely. 
And I'm happy that you speak your mind, Joe. It's great to have you on the show. And I love people who, who are independent enough to stand up for what they believe in. It's great. I, I try to do my best in that area as well. <laughs> Joe, it's really good to have you on the show. It's a pleasure. And please come back and tell us more. We're going to, I hope we're going to be able to post a link to your report. It's a super, really, really good report. I don't generally uh, endorse too many reports because I honestly, and this is my personal opinion, I think there's so many bad ones out there, but this is a really good one. So I do want to endorse it. And please come back uh, and join us again, Joe. Thanks for a really, really good discussion. Well, thank you for inviting me, Klaus. You're welcome. All right, everybody, that's it for today's show. It's a little bit shorter than usual. I just want to mention that next week we've got more great guests. And uh, first of all, the CEO of Bandwidth, David Morkin, is going to come on the show. Bandwidth is the parent company of Wi-Fi first service provider, Republic Wireless. So we're going to hear about much more about mobile Wi-Fi convergence, uh, convergence and uh, Project Salsa about, is all about seamless voice handovers. I'm going to be absolutely excited to be interviewing David Morkin next week. Also, my good friend and, co uh, and colleague, Frederick Youngerman of T Fission is coming on the show. He's been studying how carriers are using Wi-Fi to their benefit or not for a long time. And he has a beautiful global view of what's going on with Wi-Fi right across the world from Asia, right across Europe to the US and everywhere. So he's going to give us an overview of that. He's a super analyst, so I can't wait to get him on here and pick his brains as well. That's it. Don't forget to connect to me on LinkedIn. Go to the Wi-Fi Now Forum group on LinkedIn, become a member, and join the Wi-Fi Now conference in Amsterdam in November. I think that's all I have to say for today. Next week, join us, same time, same place. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.